Now on to our big question. In your opinion, which cycling items can you get away with buying cheap and which should you invest more money in? We're going to break this down into a couple of categories. Firstly, is cycling clothing and we are going to start with jerseys. Go cheap. Go cheap. Uh, a t-shirt. Uh, this year, I'm not wearing cycling jerseys anymore because it's nice. I understand for somebody who's competitive, it's more aero and you're slightly faster, but I just like riding in t-shirts. Cargo pants have changed everything for me. There is an argument for uh, a technical t-shirt because in theory, it, will, it is less likely to smell if you sweat in it a lot over a long period of time. Um, but I commuted for a long time just wearing normal t-shirts and I like wearing normal t-shirts. I even used to ride just out on gravel stuff with just normal t-shirts. Um, you definitely don't need to spend lots of money on jerseys. Technically, you do not even need one. However, if you want one, again, don't waste loads of money on it. Um, there's a lot of brands out there that are selling stuff that is not better quality for a lot of money. If you are, if you want a really, really good quality jersey, there is stuff that you can get for 50, 60, 70 quid for a jersey that is comparable in every respect to stuff that is closer to 200 pounds, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, there is. But I guess it's like normal clothing, isn't it? You, you're almost paying for designer for a, for a label at some point. Yeah, exactly. But you'll exactly. obviously know a lot more than me, but you're a full, a normal cycling jersey with pockets and everything takes a lot more work to stitch together than a t-shirt. Yes. So yeah. essentially like you, you guys did the, the tech t-shirts and out of all the Atticus t uh, tops that I own, that was my favorite top. Yeah. I mean, I wore that probably most of the time. I had to switch it out just because I didn't ride the same top every single day but it's, yeah it was just i like it um that's for me this year yeah you're right there's there's a lot more construction cost in and actually the, you a lot more construction cost in stretchy fabrics because you need specific type of machines and machinists who they're just they're just harder fabrics yeah. to work with so sometimes you're paying for that in terms of uplift so i would not buy a cycling jersey if it was entry level 100% polyester with zero stretch in it. Yeah. I would wear a t-shirt instead of wear if if it was you have to wear this jersey, I would just wear a, a bog standard t-shirt instead. If I'm going to wear a, a cycling jersey, at the very least it is going to be a good quality fabric. Yeah, you'd find in in a normal cotton t-shirt, bog standard cotton that'll have natural stretch anyway, but what you usually find is uh they wear out and they get holy quite quickly. Mm. But I, like I said, I, I wouldn't spend money in, on a cycling jersey. I'd buy, if I, if I was new, day one, don't have anything, I would save my money, wear a t-shirt, and I'd spend the money that I'm saving on buying slightly better bib shorts. So next on the list is shorts slash bib tights. Um, so good link there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Back in our Atticus days, we when we used to occasionally get emails from uh, people that are new to cycling, and one of the questions they would ask quite a lot is, what is, what do I need? What's the minimum amount of stuff I need? And we would always tell them the minimum that we recommend is a good set of bib shorts. Um, you don't need a jersey. You don't need the other stuff. But a minimum, sh a, a good pair of shorts, in our opinion, is the minimum. And it's definitely, a, for me personally, I would rather not wear shorts, bib shorts at all and wear jean shorts than wear a pair of shorts that doesn't work for me there is an element with shorts there isn't an element of personal preference mm. so some people will just not get on with certain pads i'm very fortunate to know specifically which pads across every single proper known pad manufacturer in the world which ones of them work for me so i would be able to look at a pair of bib shorts by any manufacturer and know just by looking at it whether i'm gonna i'm gonna get on with it or not yeah, I mean, the bib shorts are different to jerseys. It's not a thing of performance. It's a thing of not getting chafed to pieces and being comfortable on the bike. If you can't sit down in your saddle, you're not going to enjoy riding your bike. When we're talking good, so you're both going with investing, but you're yeah. not necessarily saying buy the most expensive oh, no. pair. Oh, God, no. no. Good and most expensive aren't necessarily that, unanimous, are they? Syn that, synonymous. That's where the industry's gone really wild at the moment, I think, is because when I was starting cycling, in the late 90s and early 2000s, ASOS was the, the gold standard and they were really expensive bib shorts. Where now, almost everybody's bib shorts cost the same, if not more than ASOS. And it's, well, 
They still make really good bib shorts. How much How, is an Asos short these days? Uh, good. A Mille is £125 full retail before any discounts. £125? £125. Good price. And they are, I, don't know, I don't know if they're good. They probably are for some people. They are excellent. Comf- I mean, in terms of I've never had anybody ride one that didn't like it. Um, but obviously, I don't even think you need to spend that much. But it's, yeah. But then there's companies spending 400 quid for a pair of bib shorts and you think... It's mad. Mad. And that only, yeah. What I can tell you and is probably something that shocks most people is that quite often the manufacturing of shorts is in line with jerseys. So there isn't that... So, so, so you'll, you'll find... For, well, Rafa's a good example. There's a point where their jersey... This is a while ago, mind. They used to sell a jersey for about 120 quid and the matching shorts are about 190 quid. But the chances are the manufacturing of those shorts cost about the same as that jersey. Yeah, you um, make a higher profit margin on, on shorts. Yes, yeah, so there's just a, a, a categorically a higher margin on them. But that, that, that's mental as well if you think about generally as black shorts where jerseys have to do loads of colours, there's more size runs, there's more different... And it's like, to stock bib shorts... I mean, I don't know, you probably know, it's easier to stock bib shorts than stock jerseys. Because you, you can go safe and do two colours of bib shorts, but you can't do two colours of jerseys and be like an actual brand. It's only recently that people started doing more coloured bib shorts anyway. Mm. Mm-hmm. But you sell them less frequently because of that as well. Most people will have, a, say, for example, a set of shorts or two sets of shorts and multiple jerseys yeah. because of fashion, I guess. You know, you want to wear something different. So although you make a higher profit from your shorts, you're selling, in a lot of cases, less units than you would. So Should we move on to the next one? Yeah. yeah. Rain jackets. I just don't think any of them work properly. It's, this is something I've been looking into recently because I've been wanting, a, since I've moved to England and being cold and wet all the time, decide I'm going to get a proper rain jacket. And I'm busy riding one that costs £450. And it works amazingly, but it's just not worth the money. And I know if I was to go do gravel with it, it'll just tear on the first ride. Um, I think people make the mistakes of trying to get rain jackets that are really tight fitting that's made for professional athletes in racing so it's more aero. I think if you go back to more the mountain biking style where it's a bit more baggy, you don't have to, I don't know, I might be wrong, but I I don't think you have to worry about the um, breathability as much because the air can flow in from other spaces but still keep you dry. Uh, All my mountain bike rain jackets work better than my like ones that cost four times as much being a road. Mm. Yeah. So my opinion is a rain jacket is the space where you invest. You cannot get a good rain jacket that isn't very expensive. It doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you mean, like I say, you don't need it as often and you can keep it for much longer. So yes, do invest. Don't buy something. Because if you buy something cheap and it just, you get wet. Then well, yeah, it won't work. It won't but be a rain jacket. I do think, be smart on how you spend your money. Don't be just, if you're not going to be racing, don't focus on buying one that is mega tight fitting. Rather get something that's going to work slightly better um, in terms of keeping you dry, uh, but it's maybe a bit more baggy. But that's, I think for me, that's part of the problem is a lot. So if you are under, so there's there's a water rating system for fabrics. If it's under 20,000 millimeters per hydro head, or H, hydro head uh, is is the, the method that they use. They basically put it under pressure and see how much it can take. Yeah. Uh, anything under 20,000 millimeters is not really going to be a rain jacket. Um, the majority of rain jackets in the cycling space are 10,000, which is never going to keep you dry. Then what they do is that then they put DWR coatings, which is basically an outside chemical coating, which beads. And then marketeers have convinced people that beading means that it's better at keeping water out. It isn't. It's just an outside coating that will last a couple of washes and then wear off. You have to retreat, don't you? Yeah, and you have to retreat it. And it will. It never really treats that well. It's never um, the same as when you first get it. Beading does help the fabric work but it isn't the thing that is waterproof or not waterproof. It kind of depends what kind of riding you're doing. If you're if you're looking at the at the weather and it says, you know, 40% chance of rain at, for an hour of your four hour ride, for example, you know, there's a slight chance you might get caught in a shower. And if you get caught in a shower, a 10,000 hydra head jacket for shower proof, it's going to do you. You put it on, you sort of get to a cafe or you get home or you whatever but if you happen to be out and it's absolutely peeing it down from start to finish, I mean, it's going to be a crap. You're going to end up wet ultimately. You're going to, but 
That's the same as like your legs are going to end up wet. Everything's going to end up wet. But if, if I'm getting caught in a shower, I'm not even going to bother with a jacket. I'm just going to let myself get wet because otherwise I, I just... It, it, I just don't see the point. But you, you'll know better than me on this one. But surely the problem isn't getting a 20,000. Getting that fabric's not hard. Getting that fabric to be that waterproof and stretchable. Yes, it, it, That's 100%. hard. And the breathability. Meaning what I'm getting at is I get if you wanted a tight fitting, fitting like a normal cycling jersey, it's incredibly hard. But if you are happy to make it, I've got a sportful one, which is loose fitting with a hood and everything. Um, it doesn't stretch at all, but surely it's much easier to make something like that. Yeah. It's more waterproof. You com- you're completely right in the sense that if you have a look at outdoor equipment, if you go to any sort of outdoor yeah. warehouse, you will find a lot of really, really good, fully waterproof fabrics and you can get access to them. Usually they're a- insanely expensive and you have to buy them by the massive roll. But if you're a big clothing company, you'll be able to do that. But you're completely right in terms of, what a person a person's stance when they're s- standing up versus when they're leaning forward on a bike, you're stretching in a completely different way. So you either have to have stretch in your fabric or you have to make it really baggy, which doesn't market very well. It doesn't sell very well because everyone thinks they need really tight. Um, and yeah, the other problem is breathability. The more you close up to water, the more you're going to close up to air coming out as well. I mean, my, my, my 450 quid jacket falls down to like... The size of half a sandwich. Yeah. I'll fit into my pocket, which is perfect for, does everything. It's over 20,000. Definitely something to look for in a jacket is taped seams because yeah. your fabric can be as good as possible, but ultimately your seams, there is a hole, there's basically a hole where every single part of the seam is. So if the jacket has taping inside it, it basically patches up those holes. So it's going to be a better product. We, we're actually quite passionate about rain jackets because we spent six years <laughs> developing a rain jacket model. And we never produced which is it, did we? Absolutely beautiful. I love that model so much. I mean, yeah, we've, we've got so many samples of it and we were never, ever, ever happy with it to release it. Well, the main issue was that we, we went, to, we used the same fabric as outdoor shops were using. But again, it was insanely expensive and you had to buy it by massive rolls and ship it in from Japan. And yeah. it, was, it was very, very, it wasn't very viable for a small business, was it? And we just didn't want to produce one that was rubbish and jimmy never rode in the rain so (laughs) didn't get a chance to test it it was going to be something like 70 grand just for the fabric oh yeah that's a lot (laughs) other accessories like arm and leg warmers and gloves and i am do you know it's it's uh, so arm warmers leg warmers buy the cheapest ones possible because you're not going to wear them that much and you just want to keep yourself a bit warm gloves for me especially highlighted by what you showed me earlier it's the same sort of thing as the rain jacket the outside of cycling world have better stuff than the cycling world. So I would now, for a rain jacket, probably not wear a cycling one. I'd probably wear a running jacket and gloves. So gloves. Ski gloves, for example. No, but it's not even that. Gloves is a difficult one because from a bike shop's perspective, we would always tell people you can't get a good form-fitting waterproof glove and warm weather glove because the waterproof ones are usually neoprene and they're only warm when they're wet. If they if it's dry, if it doesn't rain and you're wearing them, your hands are going to be cold. Um, and then really warm gloves tend to, if they get wet, your hands are cold again. So it's a bit of a, you need two sets of gloves. I've recently bought a set of... Do you, want, do you actually want to tell everyone this or you want to keep it yeah. secret for a bit? I mean... Like, no, don't gatekeep it. Tell everyone. I know how you like keeping hold of this I've info. I've been <laughs> testing it. Minus four this morning is unreal. I bought a set of cold storage waterproof gloves off Amazon, cost 13 quid, fully waterproof, fleece lined inside. My fingers were nice and warm today. And it's not a thing of waterproof to what we were talking before, it's just 100% waterproof. Like just fully sealed. Fully sealed. Stick yeah. it into, the, into a swimming pool and take it out. Your hands are still dry. Obviously, if you stick it in too deep, it'll come on the other side. But it's 13 pounds on Amazon. You showed me them earlier and I'm... Almost certainly going to get some. And the mega grippy as well. Mm. You'll never slide off. You don't even need handlebar tape with them. <laughs> um, yeah, so. I've spent so much money on gloves over the years and I've got rubbish circulation. My, my hands always end up cold. I've never found a solution that works for me apart from heated little handy things, which are rubbish for the environment and I hate using them. So I just let my hands get cold these days. But those th- those gloves you've got, I'm, I'm going to give it a go. So... The next one is actually somewhere where I would be comfortable spending more money on uh, is a multi-tool for your bike. And my argument for this is I would, I would, well, I'm comfortable spending, you know, like 30, 40, 
30, 40 quid on a multi-tool rather than like five or six quid. And the main reason for that is it sits in a bag most of the time. I want it to be of uh, stainless steel or coated in a way that it's not just going to rust up because inevitably it's going to be sitting in a damp, dingy bag for most of the time. And when I need it out on a ride somewhere, I want to pull it out and it actually works rather than being all rusted. 100% and horrible. buy good quality for that. Example? Uh, Topeak. Topeak. For Whatever me. Nick sold me last time. Topic Tube 18, because it's got a, that's if you've got tubeless type. Once again, with this, you have to look at what your bike needs. Don't just buy, because something like, a company like Topic will do loads of different multi-tools and not all of them going to work for everybody. The one we use, the Tube 18, is really good if you're running tubeless because yeah. it's got a plug tool. Um, it's got a little knife to cut off the extra bits. Um, it's got T25s. Obviously, I can go in and in, but first look at what you need in your bike. Speak to, speak to your local bike shop, ask them what. Last one in the section of tools is tire levers. Pedro's. So I think uh, you don't need really, really expensive ones because then you probably end up buying metal ones, which I would definitely never, ever, ever use. You don't want to go so cheap that they just snap. There's kind of like, you, but you can get really good tire levers for like a couple of quid. There's a com- Pedro's started doing this tire lever. It's a slightly fatter tire lever that's very popular. And then I think a lot of companies have copied them now. But if you look at Pedro's as tire levers, that's the gold standard, I would say. Um, next, we're going to look at some accessories and we're going to rattle through them because we've been really dwelling on this one. Can I do the first one? Bike lights. Buy good bike lights. Invest. Invest. 100% invest. Uh, just because it's, it's batteries, things are going to landfill if you just waste. You can buy it. A cheap light lasts a year, and then the battery doesn't work well anymore, and it's just not worth it. So you want to see where you want to go. Well, exa- yeah, exactly. It needs to be good enough quality that it actually works well. I'm going to plug them, yeah, but my exposure lights, I've got Graham the rise from these, had the same lights for 11 years now. And they yeah. still work. And at some point, the battery is going to not work that well. You can send it back to them, and they'll recondition it for you. Um, it costs pennies. They are expensive, but they're good, aren't but they? But the recondition, the, yeah. uh, if you take over how long it lasts, yeah. it's its unreal. I was talking to Chris Hall about exposure lights uh, literally a few days ago. So we met the guys that uh, are exposure. There's only, they're like super small business um, at Core Bike Show. And we tried to work it out. It was probably 2015. And at that time, me and Chris both bought exposure lights i think we actually had the same ones the diablo front one and then uh, whatever the the little red real one is and both of us still have those lights and are using those lights to this day he has sent his front light back once where they did a battery do they replace it or yeah, recondition they swap, it oh they recondition the salt whatever opening, whatever yeah. they do do to it they fix his i could probably do with getting my front light done but they all still work the only issue is i keep losing my charger or misplacing my charger. It's definitely somewhere in the house. Um, helmets. No. Um, no what? What does that mean? Helmets is a difficult one. Cheap um, or invest? N- cheap helmets pass the same safety standards, so it's going to be okay. If you are fashion conscious and you're not going to wear the helmet because it's the cheap one, then obviously, as long as you're wearing that's, the helmet... That's not what we're considering here. Well... No, it is, because there's a big study people. about p- some people... Like more if, if you're buying your kid or somebody else a helmet in your family and they don't like the helmet, they're less likely to wear it. Mm. So essentially, as long as you're happy to wear the helmet, um, they're all pass and it's not been damaged. They pass safety standards, so they are still safe. Um, I like nice helmets, so I spend on nice helmets, but you don't. I think the yeah. only, I, yeah, I agree in that because of minimum safety standards, uh, which are pretty high. Yeah. Um, or they definitely are in this country. Uh, You don't need to spend loads of money on a helmet for it to be safer. Uh, The only space where you would potentially look at investing in a a more expensive helmet or potentially a very expensive helmet is if performance slash time trialing is your thing. They're going to cost a lot more There's another one, though. Back home in South Africa, in summer, it gets warm. I mean, over 30 degrees. And I used to always, back then, pick my helmets based on how ventilated they were. So essentially, you'd have to spend more because there's less material, but you need something that can still keep your head cold. So you're not cooking inside the helmet while riding. So I think that's the only thing where I would take into consideration as well. Well, cheap helmets have loads of ventilation. Well. So yeah, but some of them just not as well ventilated as others. I'm not saying you have to buy expensive, but consider that when buying the helmet. Don't just buy the first one you see. 
Saddles and shoes. Uh, that's, I, I don't feel like we can answer that. You definitely don't need to spend the most expensive amount of money, but ultimately saddles and shoes are such a personal thing that you should be buying the one that is appropriate for you, uh, which is a really hard thing to say because if you're anything like me and Emily and probably everyone else I know, you've had to have, have tried a bazillion pairs of shoes and a bazillion saddles to actually work out which ones are right for it's you. It's the same thing with the paper shorts, isn't it? It's just very buy, personal. Buy, buy the right saddle for you, but at the same time, the major companies, Sele Marco, Sele Italia, Physique and all of them will do different levels of the same shaped saddle. Yeah. So just because if if the set saddle works for you, doesn't mean you have to buy the 3D printed carbon rail version. Pounds, you can yeah. just buy the cheaper railed normal one and it's it's going to work. You don't have to buy it. If, you, if you've got the money and you want to do it, by all means. But uh, I think the main thing is, I feel like we've talked about this before as well, try as many different ones as you can. If you've yeah. got mates, try and swap them or use something, even if it's an old version or whatever, so you can decide what profile works for you, whether you like a cutout, et cetera. Or go to your bike shop. Yeah. You tried the one. I did, yeah. Us. You yeah. let me try one and you got a sale out of it, didn't you? No, you, did, he, you didn't, you didn't like, like the one first one. You. You, oh, I you didn't like the first one, one yeah, did yeah. I? Yeah, I like the second one, yeah. You, with this, and the second one was a version of the one you already knew you liked. But it's good, but then you know. <laughs> but, but it's good to know because, I mean, I rode the same shaped saddle for years and years and I thought I was always fine. And then mm -hmm. I only swapped when I test rode a different bike. The, with the, the saddle on. That is exactly yeah. what happened to me on numerous occasions. Is I was like, oh, my saddle's fine. I don't need to do anything else. And then for whatever reason, you end up trying another one. You're like, oh, actually, that's better than yeah, what is. I thought. I've, I've now got a new standard of what's nice. 20, 20 years of riding the same saddles, thinking they're perfect. I've never had any issues. And now was, I could never go back to them. Um, bar tape. Uh, you cork don't... tape. Cork tape is the best tape. It doesn't last as long, but you don't need to spend loads of money. I hate cork tape. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's just the the point you don't is need to spend the money. You don't need to buy no. expensive tape. Tape is just tape. Um, inner tubes. I'm kind of the same thing. You definitely don't need super expensive. But, tubes. but don't buy too cheap. Uh, we had an issue with the shop where when I first opened, there was inner tubes that cost ninety nine pence an inner tube. Yeah. Um, and out of the five hundred we ordered, about two hundred split within the first month. Cool. That was a massive issue for us. Just so thin. They just yeah, split. they're just not very well made. Um, and then it's got to do with the butyl content in the inner tube. So I'm not saying buy expensive 30 quid silly tubes, but just don't it's, buy the cheapest. It's like buy, the four or five quid mark, isn't it? Or yeah, maybe that's slight, more like yeah, yeah. seven, eight quid. If they've now. got a cheap yeah. one, just buy one up. Yeah. Um, because you don't want that inner tube that's in your, in your saddlebag when you need it to fail straight away. Because, yeah. It's Sealant. Uh, uh, all, sealant is not all made equally. No, good sealant. Uh, you need to buy good sealant. Invest because of, it's, yeah. Um, and don't fall for the marketing because some really expensive sealant or really well marketed sealant isn't any good. Um, we've been testing loads Got of different ones. A couple of examples of good sealants? Silka makes the best sealant. It's not the cheapest expensive, but it's leaps and bounds. The, the carbon one? Yeah. It's leaps right. and bounds ahead of anybody else. I've never uh, written anything better than that. If you want to save money, that worked well for us. Um, sealed quite well. Not as good as a Silka, but still worked better than most others is a Feta Mariposa. Stans has always made a good sealant. Um, I guess Stans have been in the game a long time, yeah. haven't they? They're old school mountain bike tubeless, I believe. Yeah, but uh, just remember as well that mountain bike sealant and road is a different game because of different tire pressures. Right, tires themselves. Invest. But do you need to? Do you, not, do not, not silly money, but uh, don't don't be buying the cheapest, worstly made tire because if you buy, uh, how you buy? You know, a, a lot, a lot of this section is the same sort of thing. It's actually yeah. the mid, the mid space is actually really good. But at, at the same time, your tire is gonna affect how your bike rides more than the actual frame choice. Meaning, don't be buying a stupidly expensive bike and then cheap tires on it because it's just pointless. You might as well. Just have bought the cheapest bike imaginable. When, you, when you're saying cheap, I'm assuming you can get tires for like five, ten quid a tire, which are just going to be uh, yeah. I wouldn't do that. Sketch fest. Look, whereas yeah. the, a typical tire these days is like fifty, sixty, seventy quid a tire. I remember we talked about it last week the Michelin ones that you say that, that are no longer around. They're about thirty quid a tire, yeah. and they are absolutely outstanding tires. Yeah. So it's kind of that. Ultimately, for about thirty quid a tire, you can get a tire which is just perfect. But uh, I don't want to put a price on because it's that tire. Then I've seen other tires that cost a hundred quid that are terrible, and I've seen tires that cost 
15 quid that are good as well. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a bit of look into it. Don't just, yeah. Uh, but don't just be buying the cheapest tires because you might regret it. But also don't just buy the most expensive tires because you'll also regret it. So, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, there's no real good answer for this one. 